Hi, I'm Mike Brown, talking about the Bell 47 here at Oshkosh uh, this morning. These were uh, developed back in the 1940s, actually. Uh, this model right here is a 1966. We have three here at Oshkosh giving rides in the six, seven days that we give rides. We'll probably give around 3,000 people a ride. So they, they are a workhorse. Um, and they're, they're still being used commercially. Uh, it's the first helicopter that was certified by the CAA um, back in the day. So um, they, and it's, it's pure utility. The shape of the um, plexiglass here is uh, similar to a water droplet. And they found that that was an extremely low uh, resistance to the to the wind, low drag coefficients, coefficiency. Um, looks like it's easy to get in and out, but it's actually fairly difficult. You have to kind of wiggle your way in. These these aren't as big as as uh, as it seems. Um, we've got brackets here for the the doors. We fly with the doors off or on, but it gets awfully warm with the greenhouse effect uh, there. Um, you know the the helicopter is a just unbelievable feat of engineering to be able to control this thing in the air. You know, it, we have our cyclic uh, control and that actually controls the plane of the main rotor as it spins. And you can see it here, it, it adjusts controls that change the pitch of the main rotor blade every cycle as it comes around. If you want it to go forward, because of uh, geometric precession on a spinning body, you actually have the minimum pitch 90 degrees to where you want the action. So you have minimum pitch here, the, the blade reaches its lowest pitch there, but it's already starting to pitch up and then it comes up in the back if you want to go forward. But you, you adjust the, the pitch of the blade cyclically with this to get to adjust the total thrust of the main rotor. You have the collective and that collectively changes the pitch on both, both rotors. As you adjust the collective, it requires more power, more torque, which is more twist on the on the main shaft and of course action reaction the tail will want to to change so then you have your um, tail rotor pedals and it uh, adjusts we have just a small propeller basically on the the tail rotor and it adjusts the pitch on those blades back there then also to make it more sporty we have to manually adjust the throttle when we're flying. So whenever you adjust the torque, you have to adjust the throttle because you have to maintain uh, a specific RPM on the main rotor system. Because this, uh, these blades, they, they have several different kinds of blades. These blades are metal blades. The uh, other, one of our other um, helicopter, two of our other helicopters, they have wooden blades and they're actually, um, uh, they have spruce and balsa um, in there with fabric covering over them. The neat thing with the wooden blades is they're an unlimited life. You just, just check it because they don't build up stresses. The uh, metal blades have a 5,000 hour life uh, limit on them because they will build up stress. Um, they, they are heavier, so they have more inertia, so that comes into effect if, if you have to do an auto rotation, if you happen to lose the power plant. Um, we can talk about that in a minute. Um, in this helicopter, we've got our battery in the front. Um, other helicopters have them behind the, the cockpit. Um, but, but this is a twist grip throttle and you roll it on um, and so you have you have your RPM set and as you pull in pitch you have to roll in more throttle and 
helicopter pilots that, that fly this kind of a helicopter almost have like Marty Feldman eyes, if you know Marty Feldman, the actor. He, he had a, an eye that was off a little bit. But you have one eye on that tachometer all the time because the tachometer is everything. The other eye, you're kind of looking out where you're flying, but that one eye, especially on takeoff and landing. Um, you know, this has just a, a skid gear on it. Very simple, um, very sturdy. Um, and then these are our ground handling wheels. There are several different flavors of these, but they just, they clip on and then it has an over center where we put a, a big rod in here, have somebody grab onto the tail and we take this over center and put a pin in it and then we can push the helicopter around. Um, uh, fuel tanks, I think this is 57 gallons. Um, uh, we have other tanks that are uh, 30, nope, 45 I think. Uh, they're a, a shorter tank. Uh, when we're flying, we only go out for an hour and a half, uh, and then we change out. We put in uh, about 34 gallons. Um, the engine runs, burns about 12 gallons an hour. Um, these are uh, VO425 like homings. Uh, the stock horsepower is 260. Um, and they have different flavors of those because you can get get an engine with stock compression, which is a little lower power. These have high, high dome pistons for more power. Some of the helicopters had turbochargers on them, but most of those have been removed because they're just complex and expensive to maintain. Um, this one did have it uh, on it. It was a military training helicopter uh, quite some time ago. There are several different oil systems. Uh, this, we keep about uh, six and a half quarts of oil in here. Um, it's got a dry sump uh, on the engine, which pumps the oil up to here. The oil actually goes through the engine, but it also is the same oil that runs through the transmission on the top of the, the engine. And the, the transmission oil just drains right down into the engine itself, and it's pumped through. Uh, we've got, this is our hydraulic tank, not much to it, um, and it's a single hydraulic system. We have these hydraulic servos that uh, boost our inputs. Uh, it would be, we can fly the helicopter without hydraulics, but it is a challenge. It, it, you know, it, it's a lot of work. You would not want to fly this helicopter without the hydraulic boost. Um, back in here, you can see it, we've got a couple of belts, and that comes off the transmission up at the top, goes down to this fan, and it's a freewheeling fan. It runs one way, the, the, the belt. And then it's through this um, canvas bellows that it forces the air through the cylinders to cool, cool the engine. Um, let me go back here a little further and look forward. So we've got the engine down below carburetor, um, then it comes up, and you see this pivot right here. There's one on the front side of the transmission, one on the rear. We call this the basket, but this right here, this, this and the other point in the front, these are the two points that lift the whole helicopter. And yeah, it's kind of amazing. This is our tail rotor drive shaft, runs the length. Our, uh, our rotor arc tachometer right here. We've got an alternator, the blue um, item over there. The flight controls, this is our swash plate. It takes stationary inputs and then it has a big bearing surface in there and it, it transitions that to a rotating um, uh, movement and then from there it goes up through the scissors links 
up the pitch link to the stabilizer bar and in this stabilizer bar it has these dampers on it which slow down the, the movement of this but your control inputs are mixed in with this stabilizer bar and then it goes up to the main rotor blades this makes it really easy to fly as far as helicopters go um, some of the crop dusters have uh, taken off the stabilizer bar it saves 30 pounds or so and every pound that you can save you can put more fertilizer on um, this is a, they call it an underslung hinged main rotor system. And it, I can, I can tip it just a little, it pivots and it's freewheeling right there. I mean, it, it'll seek its own, own center. Um, that underslung, it gives it stability uh, when you're in flight. The, the only thing you have to always have uh, positive G's on the on the main rotor system if you unload it get to zero G or negative G's it'll it'll flip-flop and you can get a uh, main rotor or mast bumping which that'll end your day that'll end all your days so we don't want that um, these are called drag braces and it just it just sets the blade up for lead and lag they call it uh, and that's set with maintenance and that that gives you a good ride you can see the multiple um, what do I want to call that laminations that, that go out from the the hub um, and uh, it's yeah, it's a black black magic somehow the maintenance guys get that all to work so well and uh, get it so that it's really smooth um, so our tail rotor drive shaft we've got a, a short shaft here and this actually has some play in it and that's because this tail boom flexes and so so if it flexes up it, the the shaft has to be able to to take take up some of that movement and then we have multiple bearings and I mean from the 1940s design uh, they're open bearings with grease certs on them we the factory calls for uh, grease every 25 hours we do it every 12 grease is a whole lot cheaper than a bearing if you because it's not sealed if you fly it in the rain, you have to purge all the bearings because the grease gets water in it, turns milky, and you know, it's not good for the bearings. So we have to do that. Um, a lot of the helicopters do not have a muffler on it, on the exhaust. But uh, since we're given rides, uh, we, we have on all ours, it really makes a big difference on the amount of noise that's pretty noisy um, uh, without with it being a straight pipe uh, we've got two sets of cables here um, one set is for the tail rotor controls and then the other set is um, for our little horizontal stabilizer back there that is when you push the cyclic forward it helps keep the the nose from tipping real far forward when you're in flight it and it helps with the CG envelope so you can load more weight up front um, this is our vertical stabilizer it helps a little bit with keeping it from wagging its tail when you're flying if you have a tail rotor failure keep your airspeed up this will help keep the helicopter pointed in the direction you want and you just come in and do a run on landing and then you adjust your which way the helicopter is pointed with the throttle as you're coming in and you actually can take your little finger on the throttle and whichever way the finger goes that's the way the nose will go so it's 
kind of interesting. Um, again, just the the long shaft goes into another short shaft, and this this has another coupling that gives flex. We've got a universal joint here, takes it up to the tail rotor gearbox. Um, the tail rotor, the pedals are hooked into this this cable, so it, it runs a jack screw that on the other side, if you want to walk around there, you can you can see it it moves everything in and out. And then that goes through the pitch change links and uh, changes the pitch on the tail rotor. And that's just to compensate for the torque that you're putting into the main rotor. Um, there's also, they, they call this a delta hinge. This, this is allowed to flap and, and seek its own center. But as you move forward and you have airspeed, or if you have wind that's blowing down from the main rotor, the advancing blade gets more airspeed on it than the retreating blade. So to compensate for the loss of lift on one blade and the gain of lift on the other, it will flap. That also happens on the main rotor when you're in forward flight. The advancing blade flaps up, the retreating blade flaps down, changes your angle of incidence on the, air pl on the uh, blade and it compensates so that it all evens out. There is a, a thing with the main rotor where you can get into retreating blade stall. That's if you go so fast that the retreating blade, the wind over it, the relative wind, gets so low that it stalls out. And what'll happen is the helicopter will pitch up and roll over on its side if you get going too fast. So it's always good to obey the laws of physics and the limitations that, that people put on you. Um, that's pretty much it for the tail back here. You know, this is, this is pure utility. You know, this, this is a workhorse. And I remember Bert Rutan once said, I saw him here at Oshkosh back in the 70s, I think. He said, I take something, I throw it up. If it comes back on the ground and it doesn't help the airplane fly, I don't put it on. Well, that's pretty much what Bell did, I think. There's no covering, everything's exposed. Um, and it's, uh, it's just purely functional, you know, and there's, there's nothing to make it look pretty or anything, but it just really keeps it easy to maintain. It's, it's wide open, um, you know, and we can, we can just look at it, uh, see everything, inspect it really good. Um, the, the two tanks I didn't mention earlier, they are interconnected. Um, they have sleeving on it so that if there's any leakage, it gets drained out. Yeah, you know, it's you know here's here's the tanks, here's the exhaust system. So definitely don't want any fuel leaking on that. And they they go it goes through a gasolator and then down to the carburetor. Um, all our air going into the carburetor is filtered on a on this helicopter. Um, we've got an air intake in the in the middle here with this hose that goes down and then we can add um, heated air off the exhaust on the other side. We take off and land with no carb heat to get maximum power, but um, these engines, the, the carburetor will ice up pretty easy uh, because of the reduction of air pressure, the venturi effect, it gets cold and the moisture in the air will, will freeze up and uh, coat the intake uh, tube and then it'll, it can close it off and kill your engine. So once we get up 100 feet or so, we throw carb heat on and we have a we have a gauge and we just keep the temperature in the green. So um, it's 
it's also an interesting machine in that we've we've got one machine with the wooden blades with the stock pistons and when you get it loaded up we can have up to 550 pounds in the cockpit um, on a hot day you take off and land with it full throttle you know and sometimes with a good load you get one chance to make your your target where you want to land or you're going to drag it across the ground because it just won't hover um, so um, uh, one thing when when you're taking off when you pick up into a hover you're re-ingesting the the air and you create a column a vertical column of air coming down but if you're in ground effect that it, it slows that column down but it it reduces the efficiency of the lift of the main rotor so as you start to move forward you get into clean undisturbed air not that air that's moving down and uh, they call call that going through effective transitional lift or ETL and you can see it when they take off uh, especially with the heavy load with the small engine helicopter there's been many times when I'll, I'll start I'll, I'll be able to get it just up off the ground and then I'll start forward and then it'll come down and kiss the ground and then come come back up just as it goes through ETL and in Vietnam with the Huey, with the original Huey, they'd be loaded up and they'd have guys run alongside the helicopter. And then as it, as it did its little dip to, to get through ETL, they'd jump on. And they couldn't, it wouldn't fly with, with them on. So pretty interesting kind of stuff. Um, we got, uh, this is a throttle correlator. Um, you know, we, we, we have our hand inputs on the hand throttle. Then as you pull collective in, it will automatically add throttle as you're at asking for more power, but it's pretty rudimentary. So you end up having to keep that one eye on the, the tack and, and add it. After, after a while, you get used to it. You just know, and, and every helicopter's got its own personality every 47 so you have to know but after a few flights you get, you just know you have to add this much or if you're leveling off at altitude you have to give it a certain amount of twist as you as you lower it um, you know, these are all oil lines and the starter one of the mags there's one on each side um, this particular one has, these are P-leads, that's what grounds out the mag to kill it. This one has two leads on it because it, it has a, a retard uh, circuit breaker, uh, retard uh, breaker points um, on it, which makes it easier to start. It starts in the retarded position, then moves forward. This is where the alternate battery spot is. Um, oil cooler um, and uh, this is we call this the Lord mounts the the basket that the transmission and engine hang off of it, it comes out here goes through this rubber isolator and then there's four bolts here that, that hold hold this on and then one bolt through here so there's there's a lot of single bolts holding this thing in the air you know and the engineers got it right because it it works itself uh to death you know and, and just keeps on running it's it's just a great machine um we have right here a little cheat sheet yeah just to tell you how many gallons you can look in the in the cap and and see how much fuel you've got on board then that way it's got gauges but we don't trust them, so we just we just fly with quantity and time and uh, consumption. So yeah, we got the tail tail rotor pedals. All right, uh, collective and throttle cyclic. Um, here's our carb heat and pull that down once we're airborne. 
to, to keep it hot. Uh, radio, transponder, our carb heat gauge, we keep it in the green right at the above the yellow there. Our mag switch, master generator, intercom. We have the hydraulics that we can turn on and off. Um, then uh, tachometer, it's got two needles on it. One's for the engine. This engine uh, runs a lot faster than airplane engines. Um, we start it, we run it right up to 1700 RPM. It has a centrifugal clutch built into the transmission. And so we run it at 1700. We're looking for oil pressure. Uh, when the main rotor, the shorter of the two uh, pointers, gets to a th uh, 100 RPM is what it is, then we we bring the we bring the throttle back to idle, let them join up, and then we run it up to about 2,500 RPM, and we let it warm up at 2,500 RPM. Then we run it up to 3,200 RPM, and that's our normal operating speed on that engine. That's why these engines are overhauled at 1,200 hours um, instead of the 2,500 hours that an airplane engine that runs at 23, 2,500 RPM would. Got our airspeed. This one's in knots. The other ones are in miles per hour. Um, we normally cruise around here at about 50 to 60 knots. And that's what we ought to rotate at is 50 knots. So you're cruising right at the speed you want if you lose engine power. Um, manifold pressure, it's just a, a function. It gives us um, an idea of how much power we're, we've got. Um, this helicopter, uh, at about 20 inches of manifold pressure, it will start to lift off the ground, depending on your weight and density altitude, but right around there. And then we can take it up and get about 27 inches of manifold pressure out of it, and that's what we climb at. And then once we're in level flight, um, it usually runs around 20 inches in flight. And that's, so we're, we're, we're just lifting off at 20, but that's, what we cruise at because we're in that cleaner air we've gone through that effective transitional lift um, and everything's running more efficiently um, cylinder head temperature amps for our generator um, we've got a we can look at our um, oil temperature from um, the engine or from the transmission so when we start it, we start with the engine oil temp, make sure it gets into the green, and then we run it in the uh, transmission oil temp because that's that's where the most heat is generated in flight. Um, we've got oil temp, pressure, um, fuel that we ignore for the most part. Um, yeah, and then beacon, nav, um, a radio master, and strobe lights then our our huge circuit breaker panel here <laughs> it's it's such a simple machine you know if, if if we were flying and we lose the engine um you know and it's it's a piece of machinery it can happen we practice every year uh auto rotations and all you do is you bottom the collective out you shoot for 50 miles an hour uh airspeed or 50 knots in this and it's fully controllable you're coming down at i don't know thousand twelve hundred foot per minute something like that it's very controllable we can at 400 feet above the ground we can make a 180 degree turn and that's all you're going to get out of it but um but it's fully controllable all the way down we get down to about 50 feet we do a basically what you do is a quick stop you you, you pull back on the cyclic you flare that shoots more air through the main rotor helps spin it up and then you you level it and come to a stop and and just do a hovering auto rotation so um, very controllable uh, very safe we practice it a lot it is challenging here on the grounds because sometimes it 
your only spot is going to be between rows of parked cars and that sort of thing. So, uh, and you always have to keep an eye out, understand where the wires are. Wires are invisible from the air. So the thing we're looking for is poles. If I can see poles, I know there's wires between them. So. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, and we do offer rides here at Oshkosh, uh, $60 uh, per person for a five to seven minute ride. Anyway, I'm getting yelled at. I gotta get out. Hey, I'm being famous here. Leave me alone. I'm a star.